uh, we ask that all participants please keep their lines muted just to avoid any feedback during the presentation um, so we can share that with your team. Um, so next slide please. So as, as I mentioned, the objective of today will be to provide your project teams with the guidance, support, and informative tools to meet your quarterly reporting clients, compliance um, within the COVID-19 program portfolio. Um, and today's agenda, next slide please, uh, we'll be covering um, just a brief overview on the cybersecurity um, importance during this process given the recent um, environment. We'll be reviewing an, the quarterly report as well as an overview of the claims process with some very informative demos and we'll save time at the end for questions and share some of our resources um, for you and your team to access um, during, during, during each quarter. Um, before we kick things off, uh, next slide please, I just wanted to um, just emphasize the importance of cybersecurity. And as you all know, COVID has had a profound impact on our country as well as our world, especially in regards to life sciences, pardon me, life science researchers and innovators. Um, and to lead in Canada's efforts to address the pandemic, the Government of Canada at the Canadian Centre for Cybersecurity um, has introduced um, that this is this is something that needs to be addressed um, and, and in a proactive response. So what they're doing is asking all organizations involved in the COVID-19 program to be alert and to protect their knowledge and sci scientific know-how from potential threats. They have a few uh, recommendations on the next slide in terms of best practices. Um, and we can just quickly run through these and, and just stress the importance that throughout the entirety of your project, um, we just want to make sure that you're increasing the monitoring of your network logs, um, remind all of your employees to be, to be alert um, for any suspicious activity, for example, phishing attempts, to encourage you to use multi-factor multi authentication, implement tel secure tele-networking um, practices, as well as back up your data, and lastly, apply any firewalls and antivirus software um, patching servers. And so all of these resources will be distributed at the, in the follow-up communication to your teams um, later this afternoon, um, inclusive of the recording. So with that, um, over to you, Nadia. Hi everyone, hopefully everyone can hear me. Um, welcome to our first workshop. I was very excited to have everybody here. First of all, a huge congratulations on bringing your ideas and projects all the way to, to this point. We're, we're a little excited and, 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 and surprised by how, how quickly the quarterly mark has come for a lot of our projects. And um, really excited to see how things are progressing. Uh, you know, for some of you, you're still in contracting, others are past the contracting stage. So we wanted to take this opportunity to kind of walk through uh, the, the requirements for quarterly reporting, uh, break it down for you guys and really empower your, you and your team to be able to, to, uh, to report to us in, in as smooth a manner as possible. So let me... So for many of you, you would have seen this slide um, when we did your MPA kickoff. So it gives you an overview of how we have structured uh, the COVID program. So what we have done is that we have created uh, quarterly check-in points across the, the lifetime of the project. The quarterly point is nothing more than a, a time checkpoint, which allows us to take stock of the project. So not only us at the super cluster, but us as, as the entire team. And the, the, it is, the intention here is for us to really understand how the project is progressing and taking an opportunity to see if there are any pivots or tweaks that are required in terms of delivery, in terms of your budgeting. And, and of course, um, it is also the opportunity for you to put in your claims and, and get your next tranche of, of, of funding. So if we look at the quarterly report, uh, the quarterly mark, 
uh, you know, the both the MPA and, and our kickoff slides have have spoken to the quarterly report and the claims process, and we sort of lump them under this one line. And today we're going to take the opportunity of really magnifying that space and allowing us to, to kind of communicate what the expectations are from our side and also provide you a platform to ask us questions uh, and understand what are some of the, the resources and tools that are available to you to meet these requirements. So in terms of the timelines, what we have for the quarterly report uh, requirements is that we have the quarterly report that is part of the SOW, um, you know, in section F of the MPA for those of you who are working through it. And the quarterly report is a project monitoring and forecasting report with the intention of really understanding where the project delivery lies and how the budget spend and the forecasting will look for it. Uh, the quarterly report is due 30 days after the quarter ends. Um, at the 45 days after the quarter ends, what we have is, you know, we, we are expecting all claims to be submitted for the for the project and the claims it provides a detail of the actual eligible costs that have incurred for the project during the quarter i think it's you know it's it's worth it to take take a minute to to understand how we're calculating when a quarter ends so for a lot of our projects you know your start date uh, for some of you you have taken the date that the award was given others have taken the signing date so we have a multitude of days of you know starting days that we've done so what we are recommending is that we take the last day of the quarter month to be your quarter end so that does provide um you know the first quarter to be a slightly you know, off, off mark, and in some cases, the last quarter to be slightly off mark, depending on where, when you are ending your project. But um, so if your project started on uh, 15th May, instead of your quarter ending on 15th August, we would see it to be 31st August. Um, and so that would kind of give everybody an opportunity to make sure that their books are closed and, and they're working through it. If you would like to choose, um, a different um, way to end your quarter because of the way the financial your financial systems are set up or the way your reporting in-house systems are set up uh, you are most welcome to speak to your program associate to ensure that we know what those dates look like so your program associate is is, is the super cluster person who was helping you with your contracting so in terms of the quarterly reporting, just to kind of summarize, we, we have two, two core reports. So that's the quarterly report that will come in and then the claim uh, form uh, that needs to be submitted with your supporting document. Both of them are Excel files. Um, the quarterly report is, is emailed to the programs team. So that's your program associate and Linda Zeng and her email is that we will provide you at the end of the, of the presentation. The claims, form and the supporting documents need to be submitted through the SharePoint portal. Uh, in, um, you know, for both of these reports, the reports are done at a project level. And for those of you ha who have taken on the role of the project lead, that means that, uh, uh, you know, taking the collaborative innovation um, mantra of the supercluster that you will be working very closely with your project consortium members to ensure that you are getting all the information from them. And neither one of these reports can be done without inputs from all your team members. So, um, Kaylee, if there are, I just wanted to know if there are any questions uh, regarding quarterly reports that have come in. Oh, thanks, Nadia. At this no. time, no, but please um, don't be shy. Ooh. We, we do have one. I think this is this is from Mark. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'll just ask the question and, and if there's any uh, any um, back and forth, Mark will ask you and unmute your line. Um, Nadia, as an example, if a project began July 17th, end of first quarter would be September 30th, then according to usual annual recorders, um, so pardon me, then according to the usual Usual, usual annual quarters, i.e. Q1, Jan 1 to March 31st, Q2, mm -hmm. Q3, Q4. Um, Mark, would you mind just providing um, a little bit more context with and unmuting your line, please? Yeah, sure. I'm just wondering, uh, because our, our project began January, uh, July 17, so just to, as an example uh, for your, uh, your quarterly reporting system, uh, is the first quarter, should we go until September 30th or uh, 
typically would be, I guess, the October 17th would be the three months sort of after that, or how, how would you sort of take this example? So you could you could do it um, October thirtieth uh, or September thirtieth, depending on which one you how, how you, which one ever you would like it like it to be the easiest. Okay, so Our a little default, bit of flexibility. We are we are giving a little bit of flexibility over here because we know we're starting at these odd dates. A lot of yeah. it is based on award, uh, and and because a lot of this information requires inputs from your system. So whether that's your timesheet systems or if it's your uh, financial systems. You know, we need to make sure that that your books are closed and and you are you are in a position to do so. So, um, you know, you could easily have it as October thirtieth, and we would be absolutely okay with that. If you find that thirtieth September, you know, having it kind of just line up with the quarters would be overwhelming for your for your world. You know, we could push it out by one month. So we have a little bit of flexibility. And if you would like to um, have more clarity on that we can you know we can work with you and just sort of say okay this is going to be the dates and build that schedule out so that we know exactly yeah. what your dates are going to look like and then at the moment we're just you, sorry yeah i was just gonna say subsequently after that it would just be every three months subsequently after that it'll be every three months okay. um yeah so that it's only for the first month that you know yeah. we understand that that they may be an issue the book and quarters will will not necessarily always be three months and we we appreciate that and we, we will work with that Sounds good, thanks. Thanks for your question, Mark. Um, we'll take one more from Rick Schultz. Um, Nadia, how do we access the SharePoint portal? Um, I, I mean, um, yes. great, great question. <laughs> it is a great question. It, it, is it is a great question. And I know that my colleague Wade, who will be walking through the clean system, will, will go into it in greater detail. But I think, um, so, so the access for the SharePoint server will be for your project lead PM or the financial controller. So the party who, responsible for completing and uploading the clean form to set up your, um, share, to, to, set, to set up your um, login credentials and, 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 and all of that for you and your team members, um, you can go through your program associate uh, and they will kind of connect you to the finance team to to um, to get all the information that we need. We will need from you the your the name, the title. We need a raise. We we need um, a specific address. So you, we can't use finance at abc.com, for example. We would need you know John Doe at abc.com. So we do need a specific address that that it will be linked to, and that is needed for the audit trail and to ensure that we know who is uploading and. Uh, the, and accessing files on that server. But I know that Wade will go through that uh, in greater detail. He's got a, some great screenshots to kind of orient everybody to the to the site as well. Awesome. Yeah. Um, thanks, Nadia, for, for doing that. And um, uh, just one last, last follow-up from Rick. Um, they have their initial claim ready as of August 4th. Are they able to use August 4th as their, as their first quarter <laughs> end? Absolutely. Right. So you can use, uh, if, if, if it makes it easier for you, absolutely. Um, we can use the fourth quarter, uh, fourth August as, as your quarter end, and we can continue to use the fourth to be the, the quarter end date for your, for your project. Awesome, thank you. Um, no, no questions um, in the chat, so please continue. Awesome. All right, uh, so let's talk about what is the quarterly report. So this is the, uh, the, the programs, uh, over, you know, this is a, a report that is intended to capture the project progress. Uh, so it has a lot of information about what the project has been able to achieve in terms of deliverables and in terms of your budget burn. It is also an opportunity for the project teams and for us at the supercluster to see how the work is going to be forecasted. While we understand that we worked very hard with you during the contracting to really see how the budget will fall by quarter, by deliverable, by, by consortium members, there was various cuts to it, but we also appreciate the fact that these are innovative R&D projects that don't always follow the plan as or, or the MPA plan as it's laid out. So we would like to see if there are any pivots or tweaks that you need to do, any path that was taken that you know you found that did not work, but 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 an alternate path was was kind of determined. So that the the report allows us to flag those elements provide us some high level information. And these are flags that our programs team uh, and specifically your program associate will 
may come back to you to get more information on so that we can really understand what the core outcomes of the projects are and if they're still intact from what the PSC had, um, which is the Project Selection Committee, had approved and the impacts that we are looking for, you know, in terms of the, your project. Um, the quarterly report does propagate through our um, our, our, our teams, uh, both within the supercluster and outside it. So outside the programs team that we use it to, to monitor and, and, and provide oversight to the projects themselves, the report is used by the finance team to release funds. It is also used by, by our communication team uh, to ensure um, that we have the communication materials that will support any press releases, that will support any impact stories that they are creating. Uh, the report information uh, at, you know, in some cases at an aggregate level and in other cases specific to the projects are shared with ISAT as well uh, and they use it for their communication as well as for their, their own internal reporting. And it should be noted that the quarterly report is a um, part of your project records and as such subject to audit and should be maintained so all your uh, project so all the quarterly report and any supporting documents that you use to, to create the quarterly report should be maintained uh, for at least two years after the end of the project. Um, so just a little tip over there for that one. So how do you submit the quarterly report? Uh, for the quarterly report, um, you will receive a baseline from, from our team, from the programs team, and this will be sent to the PM. So a baseline is really what it, it takes into account is whatever was the last version, uh, of, uh, last uh, version of your, of your uh, project. So for most of us right now, it's the MPA, unless you had an amendment or a change order come in. Uh, so that so we use that information to kind of pre-populate the form so you're not working with the blank form. And the intention is really for you to have an opportunity to focus on the information that needs to be updated and not 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 fill out all the all the basic information in there. So we will be updating that information as the project project progresses. It will it may also include updates and specific numbers on claims that were made and claim and the payouts that you that you had received from us so that you have that information updated in there so th at the at the um before your quarter ends you will receive an email from our from our team giving you the the next baseline to to update uh, so an excel file so that will be coming through email to you once you receive the files so for all the project managers um out there, you will need to work with your project consortium to consolidate the information. So the information that we're looking for you to, to, to capture from there are in terms of deliverables, um, what is the percentage complete of your major deliverables? So that's the deliverable list in your MPA. And what are your, um, uh, what was the budget burn? So what was the cost that incurred by each of the parties within your consortium and also what the forecast looks like for the next quarters uh, so that the forecasting information is going to inform uh, any requests for advances and any um, any adjustments or change orders that, that may be needed for your project. Once you've received all the information from your project teams, uh, the PM will need to finalize the report that may, depending on whatever governance structure you have implemented in your in your teams, may require you to go to the project sponsor or to your uh, to 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 the lead organization or principal within the project lead to confirm the report. Once it's confirmed internally, to submit it to us via email. You will be submitting it to your program associate and Linda Zhang. So uh, those will be going to us. Um, via email. Internally, we will be reviewing it if there are any questions or concerns or we find that we don't have all the information. There may be some back and forth during the process. Once we are comfortable with the report and we accept the quarterly report, we will inform the finance team. And so any approved claims that are within their systems, the payments for them will be released at that point then. It will become available to you. Uh, during the process, our team is available to support you, answer questions, uh, ensure that you feel supported um, uh, in, in both the super cluster speak and ensuring that you and the expectations that we have for the, for the reports and its completion.
Okay, so um, if you just give me one second, I'm just going to switch screens and we're going to go through um, through uh, the Excel sheet itself. So I don't know, Kaylee, while I while I switch screens, if there are any questions um, for me or for Wade, happy to answer them. No, I think um, just thanks to Mark and Rick for for their questions so far. Again, if anyone has has any questions throughout the presentation, please please feel free to, to put them in the chat. And I, I can can understand it. it's a this is a lot of information coming at you guys um, through through this informative presentation. But absolutely, just to reiterate, we will have the resources available um, for you to reference at, after the call. So thanks, Nadia. Fantastic. Okay, so what we have here is the Excel sheet that uh, uh, for the quarterly report. So the first tab is your instructions. And I know that reading instructions are not always the, the favorite part of any 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 box opening or, or any file opening, but please do, do take a, a minute or so to read it. It just gives you a sense of what the expectations are, uh, some of the key points uh, that you know completion tips that you may that we have to help you complete the report and as well as some definitions so that you that that everything is sort of aligned the report itself is made up of six uh tabs that are data entry tabs so these are the gray tabs right uh, at the bottom and i would request that you know my the recommendation is that we um that you fill these reports from left to right, each one of these tab worksheets are building and providing information to the other uh, other tabs. So you should be you should be um, uh, working from left to right and over here. Uh, for um, just a couple of tips, the report is in Excel, as you can see. And I understand not everybody is using uh, Windows, uh, but it does work best if if. You, you are working in, in Excel 2007 or newer. Uh, the way that the report is set up, all fields that are in blue are locked. So they're either auto, um, auto generated, so there's a formula at the back, or they're pre populated. We have hidden, um, uh, unhidden the formulas so that you can sort of trace back um, the information and be able to see how we're calculating some of our. Our numbers there, so 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 you can understand where to go in case there are any questions, um, and um, and the white fields of, are are for the data input. So we you know so if if you can focus over there and not try to overwrite it, that would be fantastic. Uh, so the tab, so the tab, the first tab is the project information tab. This is uh, intended to be to capture basic information regarding your project. Most of this information is available. In fact, no, all of this information is available in your scope of work, and it just brings it out and summarizes it for you. Like I said, this will be pre-populated for you in the version that you get over the next couple of weeks and 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 throughout your your project life. So the intention is really to review it and take a look at it. So the first section. Uh, identifies your consortium members, if there are any third party contributors to your project. So whether that's Microsoft or there's any third party, uh, any, any other parties that are, that are providing funding to the project. Uh, it identifies the number of, of quarters that you have. So in this demo project, which is our amazing COVID project, we have two quarters. Um, and then any major deliverables that you that we have identified in the scope of work in the scope of work for the MPA. And of course, if there are any change orders or amendments that that you that are um, that that you have uh, put in place for your project, then we just have a summary here. So just intended for us to really understand what is the baseline that we're looking at or the last legal um, document that we should be referencing. Tab B is the delivery plan. So it provides us with an opportunity to, to see um, how the project is progressing. So all the major deliverables here is a pull uh, from the project information tab. Uh, we ask that you fill out the rest of the information here. So the work that was done within this specific quarter. Uh, so just talking, so if we're talking about uh, deliverables that are spanning multiple quarters, you know, we would see that what are the partial completion, completed work that was accomplished during the, during this specific quarter or, or in the accumulated quarters that have completed. The status of the of the deliverable itself. So this is a drop down and it gives you various options, everything from uh, not started to canceled and 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 you know whether the 
the deliverables on track ahead of schedule or uh, or behind um, behind schedule. Uh, our ask is for anything that is behind schedule to please um, make sure that you use the comments field over here to to give us some update and context on on what um, why there is uh, that there are concerns you know if there are any concerns or if if we can catch up on, in terms of the project delivery. Um, then we have the concept of acceptance criteria, and the acceptance criteria is is identified as as an ask within the within the MPA. But we we didn't really uh, spend time in de defining and developing the acceptance criteria. So our, our my recommendation to you and and to all the PMs that work on our supercluster project is that you take an opportunity when uh, when the deliverable is about to start or the quarter in which the deliverable is starting to take a moment to really understand what is the minimum viable um, you know. Uh, output that you're looking from the deliverable and who will be the accepting authority within your organization uh, or within your consortium that will be uh, approving uh, or that the deliverable is complete. So in many cases, it may be um, a principle within your organization. In other cases, it may be um, you know the consumer of the deliverable so within uh, within consortium so in this case we may have uh you know one team developing the user interface but really for it to be brought into a platform by 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 another organization so we would we would need to see a um the consumer of that deliverable be to accept that the deliverable meets their needs so we asked for the uh, you know a, uh, a summary of what the definition of acceptance criteria looks like over here. So it doesn't need to be the full criteria, but but at least uh, for us to have a high level overview of it, who the accepting authority is. So you can use the title or the or name of the of their party. Um, whether the deliverable has been accepted, and that is only really needed if your deliverable is at a hundred percent. Otherwise, of course, it's a moot point. In terms of providing us an update on how your project is progressing, we have these columns here uh, under the quarters. Uh, under the quarter, we would like to see uh, what is the accumulative uh, percentage of completion for your deliverable. So whether that is at 100, you know, 100%, meaning that it's complete. So over here, we can see in this example that in quarter one, the requirement specifications is complete at 100% and has been accepted by the tech lead in org B, um, you know, in, in the other cases, the user interface is 60% complete, the backend development 50, the user testing 10, and then um, the software release is, it has not started yet. Uh, the items that are highlighted, and these are just highlights and they're, uh, they're just intended to provide flags, just show that there is, uh, there is a, a variance between what was planned in the baseline. So in this case, the MPA, uh, in, in future quarters, it will be your last quarterly report or your any change orders that have come in. Um, and, and we would ask that if, if there are any highlights over here, that, that again, that you use the comments to provide us context so that we understand what the variance is. Um, and it doesn't vary, doesn't need to be negative. You know, it may be that we have elements that have started ahead of schedule. Um, uh, and so, so um, you know, we just like we would like to understand what they are. Tab B one uh, takes what you have provided in in the delivery plan and just kind of maps it against what what was what was in our baseline. So it, it provides us a sense of what the variances are for the for the project. Uh, so you can see that over here we have a flag and that flag is for user testing that that is 15 percent below uh you know behind schedule uh our flags are set up so if you are ahead of schedule it will remain green um if you are behind schedule by more than 10 percent between 10 and 25 percent then it's an amber color otherwise it's a red color and uh, we ask that comments are provided to support um you know explanation for for why why that variance is at that level so we have provided some columns here for you to kind of um, identify the risks and the issues to the project uh, outcomes so this is this is just a um, a drop down over here 
Um, Nadia, can I just pause yeah. quite really quickly? We have a question from Rick Schultz, um, yeah. just in regards, I think, to one of your last points. So um, from Rick, some of our deliverables, for example, marketing do not have completions. They will be ongoing even past the due date. How do we indicate these? So there will be, uh, is there an output that has been defined? So we can always work like on one-on-one, so it's a very specific one, but, but they would be specific um, outputs that we would like to see within the project. So in terms of marketing, maybe it is just doing your marketing plan uh, or it is, you know, we, you, your branding is completed or, or, or something to that effect. Um, if it is an ongoing activity, what we can do for the life of the project is, can, is indicate, we can just straight line it so we can say, for, for what is delivered, what, for what is intended for the project, you can go, you know, if they're four quarters, you can do 25, uh, 50, 75, 100, and, and just outline what are, what are some of the items that are being accomplished. But I, but I would hope that we would still have a sense of what, what within that marketing bucket would need to be completed within the, within the project. Okay, awesome. So, um, so, so in terms of delivery variance, just, just a sense of what are some of the risks and then just an outline of, um, oh, sorry, I, I was on the risk to project outcomes. So yes, yeah, so just to indicate to us what is the risk to the project outcomes. And in this one specifically, we're trying to understand if, the, if, if this is a critical path deliverable and therefore we see the project delivery, um, you know, extending beyond the contract end date, if we're seeing that the deliverable will be moving forward, uh, will be uh, impacting the budget or, or you would need more resources. So we would like to understand, you know, what that delay means. In some cases, those delays in parallel activities may have, have minimal risks to the project and that, that, that is acceptable and understandable. And then just a description of, of the risk and any mitigation plans and strategies that, that will be implemented. And of course, other comments, if there's anything in special that you would like us to, to, to be able to, to read. As, you know, as you're filling out these report, this report, it's important to keep your language simple enough uh, with the understanding that there is a set of team and organizations within the periphery of your project that are consumers of this report. So other than the programs team and supercluster, we have folks sitting in Ottawa that will try to like digest this information. So we need to make sure that, you know, uh, that, that the report is, is understandable and, and highlights um, context and realities of your projects and, but also like shows off the incredible work that you all are doing. Now we move on to the to the dollar uh, side of the of the quarterly report. So what we're looking for over here is to really be able to capture an estimate uh, regarding uh, what your budget burn looked like for the for, for the reporting quarter and the forecast for the remaining quarter. So in the first quarter, we you know we can see that uh, in the MPA we saw you know, we saw that all the organizations will be spending a hundred thousand, uh, you know, but we may have, we may find that as the project has moved forward, you know, we, we have organization B was, was behind, you know, their suppliers didn't, didn't put in their information and they're just moving their work forward to the next quarter. And so we can, you know, we would, this is the, the, the type of information that that we would like to see it reported over here so that we can understand what to expect in the claims process. Now, we, we did speak about the, um, the dependency between the claims, uh, the re releasing of, of, the, of the next funds or, your, or, or the cost incurred for the quarter, you know, through your claims process dependent on the quarterly report. Uh, what we're looking for over here is for the numbers in the reporting quarter to be within 10% of what you are claiming. So we do not need it to be an exact amount, but we would like it to be near enough so that we understand, so, so we can, um, you know, do, do our forecasting and we, we can, um, you know, we can, we can do the rest of the, the reporting within that variance. Uh, if, if, if we do find that the variance is higher than 10%, um, you know, we will work with you to either, if it's a significant difference, we may work with you to update the, the quarterly report and do a resubmission of it. Otherwise, it just may be a note that we put on your file to ensure that we, un we, we capture the, the reason why it is, it is um, that there's a difference of 10%. 
The first box over here talks about the costs that are eligible for the super cluster funding. So for many of the contracts, uh, we create a table of, you know, in section um, C of your of, of the MPA. So specifically, table 3B uh, will give you inputs that will help you fill and update and understand what, you know, what information has been plugged into here. So a good way to think about table C1 is, is our, what are the, the costs that you will be putting into the clean system. Table C2 uh, talks about any costs, specific costs that are covered by your, by any third party funders that are coming to your project. So if you have, uh, if you, you are lucky enough to have, um, you know, any organization either be part of your consortium and providing you funding, uh, then they're, they're, then we would be including them within this uh, within this box. It also includes any in-kind donations uh, that a lot of our consortium members in the COVID pro program have gener generously contributed to the project. So we have everything from licenses to to equipment to 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 uh, expertise being donated to the project. Uh, you know, which is really heartening. But we do also want to take an opportunity to recognize that. So we would see that, you know, you. Uh, identifying what kind of contribution it is, whether it is third party funding, whether it is in kind cost to be put in here. We also have some certain exceptions that um, uh, over here regarding um, foreign costs or equipment purchases that were not, that were considered ineligible for, for super cluster funding. So you, we, we have provided an opportunity for you to kind of add that over here as well so that we can um, can recognize it and make sure that we understand the cost that the project is is incurring uh, as a whole. Table C3 provide it's a calculator field and really provides uh, an overview for you for you to see what is what are the fundings that supercluster that you'll be receiving from supercluster. So this is what this will go directly to the lead. Um, and the next table, which is C4, shows how the payments will 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 propagate from the from the project leads over here, organization A, to the remainder of the consortium members and what payments they're receiving. So we these the numbers we would be relying upon the project lead to tell us what they are and if if you know if they 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 shifted throughout the project, you know they 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 will probably you know go one way or the other and see how how. Um, what those payments look like. If there's any funding that was received uh, and recognized, so those th those also come in here. So all the payments that that come, you know, that 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 we see across the projects are captured in this table C4. The remainder of the tables are calculated tables. So we, what we have over here is we have um, a table uh, that shows what is the total cost the net cost for each consortium member so that we can understand what, what um, each member is putting in. And table C is, 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 is speaking to the, uh, the member co-investment. So what are, after you have received all your payments, either whether that's super cluster funding or from any third party, uh, or even within, within, within your consortium itself, what, is, what, are, what are your internally funded costs? Um, that, that you are incurring for, for, you, for yourselves. So the, the bottom two are, are calculated fields. The next uh, tab is the cost by category. So we're asking for the costs that, that have been identified in table C1 to be broken down by the cost, um, by the category cost. So these are the same categories that we had used in the, the COVID uh, budget template. And just to give us an overview of how we see the cost coming through. So whether it's in wages or, you know, if there's equipment coming through, uh, you know, that possibly they may be travel that, that, that happens, uh, you know, it may not, not be as it used to be, uh, but, um, just for a sense of us to see how it goes. So this information is, is used by our, our finance team for, for ISAT uh, reporting, you know, so um, 
so, so some care and information is needed uh, when you're filling these out. We have added so some of our, our consortium members as we worked on this report and got some feedback from some of our members. Uh, we have added these two fields over here to help you check and make sure that the information, so that you don't have to flip between the tabs. So row 17, so totals from the worksheet, table C1 tells you what the totals are for your organize, for this organization. So the totals in row 17 and row 16 should match. And if there's any difference uh, between the numbers reported in C1 and the breakdown that you're providing here uh, in tab D, uh, it gives you this information. We are ideally looking for this to be to be zero, but with the understanding that with rounding and issues, they may be they may be a couple of dollars off here and there. So tab E is your project uh, metrics. So these are a combination of ISET and supercluster metrics. So some of these questions you have answered uh, as, as we shared the PAR, which is the project activity report with you guys earlier during your contracting time. Uh, and it is also uh, has some questions that were answered during the survey. And then there's some additional questions that support the IP registry and, and uh, so IP generation. The information is, you know, so we've got the project overview providing us just, just a sense of, you know, what is your project about, any impact statements. We would, you know, special attention to be paid to key project impact or accomplishment to date. Uh, we have an overview of who is part of your project team. And uh, we know uh, from feedback that we have received from ISAT that they would like to really be able to understand uh, at, a, at, a, at a little bit more deeper level, what the member activities are on the project. So what are the core skills that they're bringing to the project and how it impacts the project. So I would ask that, uh, that you pay a little bit of uh, attention to this section of the, of the report. Uh, the project commercial outputs, we're looking to see what are all the commercial outputs and so not necessarily the, you know, for a lot of the project, it's, it's a singular platform, but there may be other commercial outputs that, that should be recognized and it can be anything from data sets that you, have, that, that you are creating uh, within the project. Uh, it may be any educational material that, that you are creating um, to support adoption of your material. I know on some of our projects we are seeing you know, uh, online training materials and an online training platform to be created to support the adoption of solutions, uh, which have potential of becoming commercial outputs. So we would like uh, all of those to be recognized, a really good way to show off how how um, the supercluster funds are, are propelling commercialization for our, our members. We have project activities, so talking about everything from environments to benefits to Canada, benefits to research, putting all of that information in here. So looking for more qualitative information over here. For the employment and capacity building section, we are looking for to understand what are some of the jobs that were created through the project. Maintain, meaning that if you had existing employees and they have been assigned to the project, so we'd like to know what that number is. Rehired, we, we have seen, especially in COVID, that for some of our members that, that uh, really struggled, uh, you know, as, as the pandemic hit and had to, uh, you know, trim their workforce to, 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 meet, to meet the, the difficulties that they were facing, but they ended up rehiring their staff back to work on some, uh, you know, to work on the supercluster project. Uh, you know, we would like to be able to see that and capture that and speak to it as well. If there's any capacity building activities to put it in there. Uh, we would also like to capture any gender and diversity benefits over here. So women, indigenous personnel and organizations that are part of your team, um, whether they are part of your team or they are they're part of your advisory team to, to kind of recognize that, that we are bringing um, these underrepresented groups into the fold um, of, of, of technology innovation. For IP strategy, we are asking that for all the IP that is generated within your projects that, that you kind of list them down over here. So we, we do understand what the expected foreground IP is and that's available in the MPA. And the default is going to have all of that information in there. But as, as your IP is generated, as you are filing for patents or you may be, uh, you know, um, marking it under trade secret, we would just like to know what kind of protections uh, are being applied to that to, to that IP, how that IP, you know, if there's any licensing terms that, that you've come up with and if there are any commercialization plans with that IP so that we can kind of speak to it. All of this information, um, 
you know, is used to report back to ISED. Um, and depending on uh, confidentiality that, that, that you may in, in, evo invoke, uh, it, will, it may also become inputs into the IP registry. Uh, any new relationships and opportunities that, that your projects are, are working through outside Canada. So we would just like to have an opportunity to take a look at it. And the last section is taken primarily from, from the MPA and what are some of the outputs that and impact statements that impact um, criteria that your the project wanted to meet. So everything from, um, you know, number of uh, end users that, that, that folks wanted to bring onto their platforms or number of hospitals that they wanted their solutions to be implemented in. So uh, this is just an opportunity for us to see how you are progressing against those targets. And the la last tab is just a reporting tab, so no input here, so just a way for us to kind of view things. It's, it's just for us to see how the costs uh, and payments uh, if they're, you know, what the variances are between the last baseline and now. So after having made the change that I'd made uh, on tab C, you can see that we had $50,000 uh, underspending in quarter one that has now gone to, I'll just make it a little bit bigger, that has now been moved to quarter two. And we can see how that propagates down across the different tables. Um, we can change that reporting to be percentage change to see how it is in terms of percentage changes and what the cumulative uh, uh, spending of the project kind of looks like. And this is just for information purposes. Uh, it allows us to see what the flags are. It allows yourselves to understand how your project and your consortium members are burning through or not burning through their budget and what that may mean in terms of replanning. Um, so yeah, so that was a whirlwind, um, that was the whirlwind tour of the um, quarterly report. And I will stop sharing my screen and go back to the presentation. And Kaylee, if there are any questions. Awesome. Know. Thanks. Thanks, Nadia. That was that was great. And I can and appreciate everyone. That was a, a lot of information. So if you have the chance, just maybe take a 30 second stand up and stretch before we move into Wade's um, Wade session. I know that there's a summary slide, Nadia, that you want to pull up on the screen. Um, and and we can get to the questions at the end of the end of the call. There's some there's a designated section. So thank you to those that are are putting those in the chat. So we've got the recap, uh, and I'll just tell you, you know, it's just a confirmation of delivery and forecast. Thirty, you know, it's due thirty days after the completion of the quarter. Everybody should be working with their project consortium. Give yourself at least five days for data collection to work with your project consortium and set aside between two to five hours to complete the report so that you have like a quiet window to kind of work through the Excel file and, and really be able to um, not only input the information, but use that information to guide your project uh, progress. So over to you, Wade. Sure, good, uh, good morning everyone, or good afternoon, depending where you are, you're calling from. Um, so to introduce myself, uh, I work in the finance and accounting team as the uh, director of finance. The finance team is Chris Studi, who is our financial analyst and is responsible for reviewing and processing all of your project claims. Uh, so before we get going, um, firstly, I just wanna say that as part of the finance team, uh, we are very proud to work with all of you as an extension of the projects team. Um, our team is excited to be at a stage where we can start processing your project claims. And we do hope to try and make this claims process a very seamless um, process for you and for the rest of your rest of the consortium members. Um, so today we will give you a high level overview of what is a project claim and to give you a sneak peek into the claims template. Um, so maybe from there, Nadia, you can go to the next slide. Great. Um, all right. So the essence of time, I'm going to try to keep things pretty light. Um, so firstly, what are project claims? Um, so supercluster, uh, digital supercluster co-invests on eligible project expenses using the co-investment rate set in the MPA. And the project claim process facilitates the reimbursement of your incurred project related expenses. Um, so a big question and something that came up earlier in this presentation was, where is the claim form template and claim related documents? 
So we have tried to create a one-stop shop for all your claim-related documents within the SharePoint website. Uh, to get access to the SharePoint website, please contact your digital supercluster project lead and provide him or her with your full name, title, and email address. Um, and was mentioned earlier by Nadia, it's just a best practices. Um, it should not be like a group email address. It should be a specific individual's email address. It's just one of the controls that we have. Um, so within SharePoint, you'll be able to download all claim related templates and guides and also upload all of your claim documents. Um, please note that we take confidentiality very seriously at Digital Supercluster regarding claims. So only you will have access to your projects folder or the, the designated people that you've allowed will have access to that folder. Um, also at Digital Supercluster, only the finance team can access the folders. Um, so next question is, when do I submit a claim? At earliest, the submission claim can be at the quarter end. Um, however, payment will only be processed following the submission and acceptance of the quarterly report. Um, so I've gone through those three things pretty quickly. So maybe next slide. All right, so a, a brief overview of um, the claim process. Uh, just a very high level overview. So first you need to request access to the claim SharePoint website or portal. Afterwards, you will receive an access confirmation email from Digital Supercluster, which will include a link to your project claim folders. Um, in a few minutes, I'll give you a quick view of what the SharePoint site looks like. Um, next, uh, you upload your claim and supporting documents to SharePoint. Um, after you have made this upload, as a best practice, please can you send an email to Digital Supercluster, just updating us of the file uploads, just to make sure no uploads slip through the cracks of our review. Um, next, during our claim review, uh, we will contact you if we need any clarifications on your claim documents, um, but hopefully if there are no issues, then you won't hear from us. Uh, once all has been reviewed and clarified, we will approve the claim. And finally, with the happy dollar sign at the end, payment will be processed to your account, and you'll also receive a letter from Supercluster just confirming that approval and payment. Um, so next slide. All right, so now we've gone into SharePoint site. So we're assuming at this stage you've got access, um, and when you follow the link that will be sent to you, um, you'll notice that there are two folders. Um, the key one, uh, sorry. The two folders, one being the templates and guides folder where you can download all project claim material. The other folder is your project folder where you'll be able to upload your claim templates and supporting material. Um, now, just to look at firstly the templates and guides folder. So next slide. Oh, yeah. um, you'll see once you open it up, you've got a number of files at your disposal to kind of support your claim submission. So the most important one uh, being the claims template itself, and we've put a big uh, red box around that. So you'll be able to download that and populate that with your expense information. Um, just briefly, I'm gonna give you information on the other folds, uh, other files that we have there. So first is the co-investment funds transfer information form. So that's where you send your banking information to Supercluster. Uh, please make sure you send us your banking information when you do your claim upload. We can't pay you unless we know where to send the money. Uh, next is the co-investment uh, claim guidelines. So if you have any questions of what classifies as an eligible cost, um, please go ahead and check those guidelines. Next is the project advance policy. So you can find out when you can ask for a super cluster um, advance, um, also how to do it, and the amount that we will generally allow. Uh, after the claim template, which I previously mentioned, you have the quarterly report, which is what uh, Nadia uh, did her presentation on. After that, we've got a bunch of templates for you to use. Uh, first is the capital expenditures approval. So if you have expenses, uh, capital expenses greater than $1 million, we do need prior approval. Um, that's just based on what the government requires. Um, also, if there are any foreign costs, uh, there are some exceptions, which you can find out in the co-investment claim, guide, uh, claim guidelines. Otherwise, please go request your foreign costs uh, prior to actually having that expense. The last one is a wage timesheet. So when you submit your expenses um, in, the claim, in the claim processing, uh, for wage expenses, we do require a timesheet as supporting material. Uh, if you've got an official timesheet, please go ahead and use it. 
Some consortiums have asked us to provide a template to provide a, just what we're kind of looking for. Um, this template will help guide you in that. Um, so on that point now, uh, I think we've teased you enough to, before we go into the claims template. Um, so maybe I'll pause there for a second to answer any questions while I upload the Excel file. Questions? It doesn't look like there are any right now, Wade, for your specific section, so we'll just hold and, and, and answer the ones that came in earlier during our Q&A. Okay, great. Um, give me a second to do this upload. Okay, can you, uh, Kelly, can you confirm that everyone can see the Excel, Excel sheet? I can, I can confirm, and if you could just increase the font size, it's a little bit um, small on our end, please. That would be helpful. No problem, it's a big form, so is that okay? Right. Perfect. I don't, to, I don't want to get too big, otherwise you lose some stuff. Okay, so now we're gonna go into the, the nitty and gritty of the claims process. Um, so this is the template itself. The template has um, I think it's 10 uh, tabs. Uh, each of those tabs has its own um, importance in the claim process. So first I'll just start with the instructions. So the very first tab you look into gives you a high level instructions. Uh, key things to note, um, only fill in the white boxes in this form. Uh, the blue boxes are, they have some code built into them and some controls. So we, we, we try to, to lock those cells. Um, the, there's an attestation right at the end of this whole process, which we ask you to kind of submit. Um, a general idea for best practice is just before you start filling in your claims uh, template, just check the SharePoint site, just in case um, there is a later version of the claims template, just to make sure you're using the right form. Um, we do allow older versions. It's just in case there were some issues or someone found a better way for us to report. Um, we try to, we continuously change that. Um, one big thing to highlight is this is an evolving process. We are continuously looking for ways to improve this, uh, make this easier for you to use this form. So if you have any ideas on um, how to improve it, please let us know. We're happy to make those adjustments and, and we could do consider all, uh, all suggestions. Um, this is also not a one-time presentation. Um, the claims process is not simple. Uh, we've tried to make it simple, but we don't always get it right perfectly. Um, so we're happy to have one-on-one -on -one meetings if needed to help guide you through this whole process. Uh, so very quickly, uh, I'm just gonna talk about the checklist. Uh, so we have the, very che the checklist and the instructions. Uh, first of all, we ask, have you read the co-investment guidelines? So it's good to know what counts as eligible, non-eligible. Um, we checklists have populated all the claim template with project related expenses. So non project related expenses do not put into this form. Uh, all foreign costs are eligible expenses or have been pre approved for co investment. So if they have not been pre approved, you got that form in the SharePoint site. Uh, capital expenses uh, over $1 million have been pre approved. So if you do have, remember to get them pre approved using the template in the SharePoint. Uh, all expense supporting documents have been uploaded to SharePoint claims website. Um, so the, the co-investment guidelines does help you um, give you some information on what supporting material is required. Uh, quick example, any ex uh, invoices or expenses greater than $500, we do require an invoice. Um, as I mentioned for wages, you need to have a, um, a timesheet. Um, yeah, and there's a couple of other items there. Digital Supercluster has my latest banking information, so please make sure you upload this in, uh, the banking form to the site. We want to get this money out the door to you as quickly as possible, and we wouldn't want this to be something that kind of holds us back for a little bit. And lastly, I have signed the project claim attestation. So that is the most important thing right at the end of the whole claim is to make sure you've signed the attestation correctly. Uh, so that's obviously just kind of the 100% checklist to make sure it's all done. Uh, so very quickly, I'm going to try to give you some key points of the different tabs. Noticing for time, we're not, uh, we, I don't want to go into too much detail. So this is what it looks like. The very first one being the summary. Um, so very quickly, you'll notice that there's two sections in the summary. Section 1A is where you give uh, just general information about the project. So 
who are you, what is the project that this relates to, uh, member type, if it's industry, post-secondary government, um, form type. So this is quite important. So we've trying to simplify the, uh, the whole process is we allow you to use the same form for project claims and also for advanced reconciliation. So depending on what you pick, this form will change slightly depending on what is needed. For now, I'm just going to collect project claims. Uh, milestone or qu uh, quarter number, just put in one to, yeah, one to nine, depending on how long your project is. Uh, very important part is the super cluster co-investment percent. So you'll find this within your um, master project agreement. And it's really important to get this right here. It's something we check and that kind of dictates how we work out your uh, co-investment dollar amount that goes to you. Uh, section 1B, most of this is pre, it will get, uh, you don't need to fill anything in here. This will be uh, populated based on the data that you give uh, and the rest of the tabs. And the most important thing at the very bottoms you'll see, as long as you fill in all the expenses correctly, uh, you'll see at the bottom, at the bottom right hand corner how much super cluster co-investment that gets you. Um, all right, so next we will talk at wages. Um, so this is normally quite complicated for a lot of people, but I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, you'll notice that we have sections for employee name, uh, which is kind of required, or employee number. Uh, you don't have to put employee number. It's just if someone wants to kind of dot the I's and cross the T's. Uh, job description. We don't want the person's title. We want to know what is their positions related to the project. Um, it's very important. Uh, you'll note there's two sections on different kinds of wages. So just in case an employee has um, different wages, wage rates uh, within a, a claim period, this allows you to break that down. Uh, you get a section for, for benefits. If you fill in everything else correctly, you'll get a total salary amount here. Uh, this column here talks about, describe the work performed, you know, what is the work performed that was project related, and just a title of supporting documents. And remember the supporting document is the uh, timesheet. And remember, it needs to be a, a signed timesheet. Um, next, I'll move to uh, subcontractors. Uh, it's a pretty straightforward uh, key things I'll just bring out is we do separate, we, are, we ask you to separate taxes from your expense, uh, just because expenses are not eligible for co-investment. Um, for general best practices, um, we have column K is the title supporting documents. And this is really just to help us be able to look for your invoices that are greater than $500 in expense um, to make sure we can get this review done quickly. Uh, next, we talk about go through travel. Uh, so very high level. Uh, with travel is um, we have to follow the uh, national joint travel directive set by the Canadian government. So if you have any questions on is business class or economy class eligible for co-investment, check that directive. Um, and just an FYI, it's economy only. Um, again, so we, we have uh, within travel, you can talk, you have sections for transportation, you have mileage, accommodation costs, any per diems, meals, and uh, incidentals. Uh, we do, sometimes you can have foreign costs within you. So let's say you attended a conference in France um, and you can put the, uh, the currency that was used, the, uh, the, the rate that you used to calculate it to get, get it back into Canadian dollars. Uh, for any domestic expenses, again, you need to separate uh, taxes. Um, all right, so I'm going to move on from travel. Other eligible costs. So this is really to try capture everything else uh, that you might have that is eligible for co-investment. Uh, so it's pretty straightforward giving us information on uh, who's the cost from and, and things like that. Again, you need to separate taxes, really important. And really ask again, make sure that you kind of reference what invoice, uh, what supporting material matches that expense to help in our review, and you can give that title um, in the section in the form. Uh, moving from there, we have a section on discounted cash cost. So always a very difficult and, and complicated section in the beginning, but it's pretty straightforward in the claims template. Um, so reminder that we're happy to work with all consortium members on any discounted cash costs uh, that you might have. So you need to pr uh, prove fair market value and both the programs team and finance at Digital Supercluster will help you with that. Uh, so most of these columns are pretty straightforward uh, proof of that uh, discounted cash cost 
I'll call it DCC as it's so much easier. Uh, proof of how you got to that DCC fair market value, description of it, um, and the amount uh, that you have put in there. Um, trying to move along very quickly, other government funded expenses. So just in case, uh, let's say you have other funds going towards the project expenses that are funded from other government entities, such as MyTax. Um, we just need you to list that funding that you received from the um, other government entities. Uh, reason being is we need to make sure that you don't receive more than 100% in costs uh, from government entities as, as part of stacking for those that are familiar with it. And it is really important to kind of keep that control. Uh, next is a section on unfunded eligible costs. So some of you in your uh, master project agreement and your budget, you have expenses which are not eligible for co-investment. So this section kind of is very, we try to make it very simple just for you to list down what those expenses are. Um, so sometimes you have foreign costs that did not get approved, capital expenses that didn't get approved, any in kind and other. Um, so if you select other, just make sure you kind of have a comment section just describing what that item is. Uh, next is non-industry. Uh, so th those are for those that are, um, it's not really mostly for the COVID projects, but if a uh, non-industry non member has expenses that they would like to kind of show that they're committed towards the project, uh, they can fill in this form, um, so it makes it pretty easy. Uh, yeah. The next section is attestation, and this is, again, please, the most important section that you make sure you fill in before you, um, uh, well, when you do submit your claim. So most of the information in the attestation, section A, section B, is pre-populated based on the summary tab. You'll notice the summary tab is almost identical to the attestation section. Um, the only additional area is at the bottom. This is where I, we need you to sign. Um, it is an attestation, basically you saying that all expenses that you have put inside this claim form are correct. There's no misleading information and nothing is false. Uh, so we just need to have your signature, the name of the person signed and the title of the person. So we do like to make sure that that person that signs it um, is an officer at the company, uh, the company name and the date. Um, so looking at time, I think I've just, just made it. Um, so that is the claims uh, template. Um, by all means, once you go into it, you'll see it's a lot easier to handle. It's, it's a lot of information to try take in so quickly. Um, but if you have any questions, just let us know. Um, Kaylee, I believe I can leave that to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Wade. And Nadia, if you could just go back to the presentation, please. We'll just do a quick um, wrap up summary on what was discussed and then we can give um, the floor to, to the participants um, and ask, to ask their questions. Um, so just a recap, I, I think um, Wade has, had gone over that. So um, the key takeaways from the session um, is really, really we wanted to make sure that you understand that co collaboration and, and project team collaboration is a critical project success factor. Timely and accurate quarterly reporting will enable the realization of impactful project outcomes. And, and the supercluster is truly an extension of your team and is an available resource to guide and support your, your, your project um, to project success. Um, thank you, Wade, for being so prompt um, with, on timing. I think now we'll go to the, um, the chat function and just take the, the, the chats, or sorry, pardon me, the questions in queue, um, kicking off with one for Nadia. Um, Mark had mentioned um, in our SharePoint, he sees a blank quarterly reporting template. Could you please confirm that we will receive a pre-populated version specific to our project? And if so, when should we expect to receive this to our quarter end? Awesome, so yes, yeah, so there's a blank template there and it's primarily there so that uh, uh, you can take a, take a peek at it uh, beforehand. Uh, you will be getting a baseline template, so don't, don't populate it or, or use it. It's, it's really there to orient you to what to expect. Uh, we are working through, so Linda and myself are working through each project and baselining um, the quarterly reports. Uh, so right now we appreciate that we are behind on some of the projects. So we, uh, there are some projects that, that completed their quarters at the end of July. So, so we're sort of, depending on when the project is, um, uh, has its uh, quarter end coming up, we've just sort of prioritized it, but we are hoping that by the 
over the next two to three weeks, everybody should have a quarterly report um, at hand. Uh, we will let you, um, and, and you know, they'll be coming in. If you, if there's, if, if we're missed you or there is, there, there is an urgency on your side, you know, you may have vacations coming up or, some, uh, or something along those lines, let us know and we will do our best to kind of accommodate uh, your timelines on your side. Rick, um, did that, or pardon me, did Mark, did that clarify your question? Awesome. Okay, so um, a question from Morgan Shields. Nadia, um, regarding tax handling, if the project leader consortium member receiving co-investment has engaged subcontractors to provide services, they will provide services where GST applies and charge the lead the gross amount, inclusive of GST. This means that the lead is responsible to pay taxes where applicable and to ensure that the contractor and invoices for services rendered are part of the claim. Although, will the claim amount, the claim amounts will not be in GST? Is this correct? That is correct. So, so tax, uh, so tax is not eligible uh, for co-investment. So, just as we has kind of spoken to it in the claims form, that we we would we would slice it out. Uh, we would ask for the same in the in the quarterly report as well, in the eligible box that we only have costs that are eligible. Great. Morgan, did, did that answer your question? Uh, it does. Can I just ask one quick follow-up, Kaylee? Uh, of oh, absolutely. absolutely. Understanding correct. So in this instance, the subcontractor would remit the GST to the project lead. The project lead would then recover that GST amount from the government on its claim. Is that a fair assumption? That that is, I, I I would I would kind of default to some to, you know on the account like the accounting part and how to to reimburse it. I I I not guide you on that, but depending on on what the rules and regulations are and what CRA says, I would <laughs> I would support you in putting that claim in. Yes. Right. the yeah. The only question in our mind is tax is a bit of a question mark, uh, mm -hmm. given that there are subcontractors involved. So. Uh, appreciate the guidance you're able to give us here and we've also asked a question that I think is being explored elsewhere so. okay so yeah maybe Wade Wade has something to add to it in terms of the tax I'm not the the best person for taxes so I can add an extra comment in there so yes uh, taxes are not eligible for co-investment um, but if you do pay taxes um, I believe that through through uh, CRA um, you're able to get income tax credits. So just check with your accounting team and, and to make sure you get those um, ITCs on your tax payments. Income tax credits, okay. And we'll see if there's a ruling as well on, on these types of investments. Okay, thanks, Wade. Yep. Uh, Mor Morgan, just while we have you on the line, do you want to, I'll just ask the question that you put in the chat as well. Is it safe to sure. assume the claims form should comprise all consortium member claims to be submitted by the project lead? For example, one claim for the project per quarter. Yes. Okay, perfect. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Nadia. <laughs> um, okay, so um, moving along, a uh, question from Rick Schultz. Is DocuSign okay for attestation? Uh, Waiter, Nadia. Sure, I can, I can answer that. As long as we see a signature on that section um, of that attestation, then it's perfectly fine. Um, yeah, we just need to have that signature because that's what we sent to the government as a proof of payment. Proof of claim, sorry. Awesome. Did that, um, thank you for answering that. Um, and the last question from the chat before we open up to the lines, um, this is from Patrick Francini. Um, are wages for non-Canadian-based -Canada employees working on the Supercluster project el eligible for reimbursement? Can you ask that again? Sorry, I missed the first oh, part. Sorry, Wade. Are wages for non-Canadian, example, US-based employees working on the Supercluster project eligible for reimbursement? Um, so technically, no. However, we can make it eligible provided you, uh, you submit a foreign cost approval request. Um, and that document is found within SharePoint. So just make sure you get that uh, sent to us. We can help you complete it to the best and to make it as, as strong of a case as possible. We then send it to the government for approval. Uh, once we get that approval, we send it back to you. Did that answer your question, Patrick? Oh. 
Yes, that's my question. Thank you. <laughs> Wonderful. Um, so I guess right now we'll just open it up to the lines if there were any other questions that you had for Nadia and Wade. Today, please um, unmute yourself and, and feel free to ask. Um, and, and something that we like to do on some of our onboarding sessions when we bring our community together virtually um, is because we have a little bit of time, we could um, just we, we, we could also open the lines for, for each of the leads to introduce themselves and tell us a little bit more about uh, your, your organization. If anyone wants to volunteer. No, don't be shy. <laughs> I see lots of familiar, familiar names on the line. Um, okay, well, we'll save that for the next session. Um, so, so I guess we're wrapping up a little bit early. That's um, it's helpful to give you guys a little bit of your time back for today. Um, just wanted to close off by saying thank you so much for your for attending today's workshop and we hope you found this session informative I know it was a lot of information to digest um, but it really was was meant to serve as an introductory guide um, to work work through the claims process uh, as well as um, the quarterly reporting to just echo both Nadia and Wade we are just so excited to have such a diverse community of projects and team members on our supercluster team and um, and again we're here to support you as an extension of your team so feel free to reach out um, as mentioned to any any one of us for questions um, I, I want to give a big shout out to Nadia Wade Chris and Linda on the line for helping to lead and develop this presentation and just as a reminder, we, I will be circulating a recording of this um, presentation with relevant resources and links that will guide you on how to navigate our website and resource portal, as well as uh, a, a, just a quick reminder in terms of best practices and the importance of cybersecurity and um, making sure that you guys are set up for success and, and um, are being diligent around that. So once again, thank you for joining us today. Um, it was great to meet you all and I hope you have a great rest of the week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye.